Hello and welcome to Five Things. I'm Dana Taylor. In the beginning, people suffering from what is now called long COVID were forced into the shadows. Their symptoms, debilitating tiredness, lung issues, and nonspecific pain didn't seem to fit together. They ping-ponged from specialist to specialist. No one seemed to want to treat all of their symptoms. Over three years into the pandemic, the medical community is still grappling with the question of treatment. Why has it remained such a mystery? I'm joined today by Dr. Francesca Bodwin, the director of the Long COVID Initiative and chair of the Department of Epidemiology at Brown University. Dr. Bodwin, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. So I want to start with a recent analysis that came out in the journal Nature Medicine that showed that people who have had even a mild case of COVID are at a heightened risk of lung problems, fatigue, diabetes, and other conditions associated with long COVID for up to two years. First, what is long COVID? You know, I pause because it's still hard to answer that question. I can give you the definition that the World Health Organization gives us, which is new or persistent symptoms three months after an initial COVID infection lasting for two months or longer, and those symptoms can take a variety of forms. And my initial hesitation is because, you know, two and a half, three years later, we're still really grappling to understand and accurately define long COVID. Well, for people who suffer from this disease, it can be isolating and devastating. I recently saw a tweet on X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, by one sufferer who wrote, Mm -hmm. thanks to long COVID, I've lost my independence, my fitness, my sense of identity, my friends, my dreams. Is it the wide array of symptoms that are causing so much suffering? Is it the isolation and loneliness? How do you advise patients to navigate all of the layers at play here? There's a few things to unpack there. I, you know, the burden of symptoms for some people is really high. And I think a commonality is the persistence of symptoms, lack of recovery after the initial COVID infection, and then a component of interfering with your day-to-day life activities. Importantly, that's actually not a part of the kind of the official definition, but I think when we think about people impacted by long COVID, what they're telling us is they can't, they have trouble going to work, they have trouble interacting with their family, doing things that they enjoy. I've talked to people who really, who have trouble getting out of bed every day. That's, and that to me is, is pretty staggering and remarkable. And then there's other people who can't go to the gym anymore. And we might say, well, no big deal, just like going to the gym is a luxury or whatever. But for that person, going to the gym is a big part of their quality of life. And so even that level of impact is important and we need to be thinking about. And then there's people maybe with more more mild symptoms, persistent loss of taste and smell. Taste and smell are important to us and our enjoyment of food and and other things. And so even that um, impacts people's day-to-day quality of life. Well, in the beginning, a lot of long COVID patients complained about being bounced around from specialist to specialist with doctors not wanting to treat all of their symptoms. Why did it take so long for the medical community to reach a consensus that this condition is real and patients need specialized care? There's a few things here. One is that there's not a clear test to diagnose long COVID. And so for a lot of people, this ends up being a diagnosis of exclusion, as we sometimes say in medicine, meaning ruling out other things. And that's actually part of the definition is that there's not something else going on because long COVID can mimic a lot of other health conditions. And so there is a piece of this that is a diagnostic challenge. Then there's a component that it does involve multiple systems throughout the body. If you're having both extreme fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, uh, this quote, brain fog and shortness of breath, who should deal with that? I, I feel strongly that a person's primary care physician, uh, primary care provider should be integrally involved in the care so they can coordinate across specialists, but it's not clear you know, who owns the care of long COVID. And so it begs the question of where should people go for quality multidisciplinary care about long COVID? There was a recent um, commentary, I believe in the New England Journal of Medicine, basically highlighting this and calling for funding for centers of excellence for long COVID care. And you see that centers of excellence play out with other chronic health conditions. And it's a place where people can receive high quality, evidence-based, multidisciplinary care. And so perhaps there is a role for centers of excellence in long COVID that doesn't exist yet. And it doesn't help people today with with long COVID. So a lot of frustration there in um, both the medical community and, and patient community. 
And I think part of why we're seeing more now than in the past is the large burden of the pandemic in general affected a lot of people. And then there's probably something very specific about this infection and this virus that led to all of these downstream consequences. And we also have the the ability to capture some of this through data in a way that we couldn't before. And so it's interesting that, you know, we didn't know about it. It was, it shouldn't have been a surprise. And this is a a good place to focus as we think about future pandemic preparedness and the, the consequences, the ripple effect once the initial infection is is stabilized or resolved. So there's treating it, and then there's the question of whether or not it's curable, is it? There currently is not a cure for long COVID. This is an area of interest and focus. Currently, we're spending a lot of time talking about symptom management. The National Institutes of Health just launched a series of clinical trials as part of the Recover Initiative with the goal of trying to facilitate recovery of long COVID. The majority of people have some recovery, but there is a subset of individuals who have persisted symptoms and have not gone back to their, you know, quote, baseline before having COVID. Well, I wonder how prevalent is it? How many Americans have had it? Hard to know exactly. There are some good estimates. The current um, estimate from the Centers for Disease Control, I believe, is that about 6% of Americans, which is a huge number, are would satisfy criteria for a long COVID. The important thing to keep in mind there, since we're talking about nearly 1 in 20 U.S. adults, is that the symptoms vary quite a bit. And so a, a lot of that's not 1 in 20 people have completely disabilitating long COVID, not leaving their house. But that encompasses the range of people who are still having some lingering effects from their initial COVID infection. And even if that is an overshoot of the number, this is real. The burden is high. A lot of people are affected. We're talking about millions and and millions of people. So who's getting long COVID? Are there groups that are more at risk? Anybody can develop long COVID. There's cases of young, healthy people in their late teens, early 20s developing long COVID, but we've come to understand that people who have a more severe initial infection are at higher risk. Vaccination appears protective. Um, The number that there's some consensus around now is that 30% reduced risk of long COVID if you're vaccinated. And then um, studies seem to demonstrate that women and older adults are more vulnerable to developing long COVID and also having persistent symptoms. So has the disease itself changed over these past three years or just our understanding of it? Probably a combination of the two. I think, you know, the data is constantly evolving, emerging. But I I think there's some indication that you earlier variants, so early in the course of the pandemic, that you were probably more likely to develop long COVID with those initial versions of, of COVID versus later now, you know, where we're seeing some escalation in COVID-19 cases and this, you know, tale of summer 2023, we won't know the downstream effects of that for months. And so it's just always this moving target, but I think that we've seen some evolution in both the Um, the risk of developing long COVID from those viruses, but then other things have changed too, right? We've introduced vaccination. We have Paxlovid changing variants. So it's very hard to disentangle all of these things that are happening simultaneously over time. If you were to develop COVID-19 today, what is your risk of long COVID? I don't know that I can give you the answer to that. So what are the most important steps that people with long COVID, they should regularly do to take care of themselves and to recover? This is where a close relationship with your primary care physician, primary care provider is important, somebody that knows you um, and that can work with you in the steps to A, getting a diagnosis. Um, If there are things like, you know, true disability, if need for work-related accommodations, pursuing some of that, engaging you and making referrals to specialists as needed for symptom management, potentially giving access to clinical trials, this relationship with somebody that knows you and that can do appropriate diagnostic tests to make sure that there isn't something else going on, because that would be unfortunate if we just started lumping all new health conditions and saying like, oh, it's long COVID, it's long COVID. You know, low thyroid levels can look very similar to long COVID. And that's just one thing, but there are many, many more. There's like two things going on. There's one, you know, 
being able to um, kind of emotionally, psychologically handle having a chronic health condition. And we could say that with diabetes, with cancer, with every other thing. And then there's pursuing the best course of treatment and, and evidence. There's a lot of parallels between long COVID and other chronic diseases. Well, does it exacerbate underlying conditions or precipitate other health problems? That is a concern and I think a real concern. There are studies reporting that people are likely to get a new dementia or Alzheimer's diagnosis um, in tandem with long COVID. And is that because long COVID is exacerbating those underlying cognitive impairments? Or is it because now someone's going to the doctor more because they're having new health problems? And while they're there, other concerns, other health conditions get unmasked. Is it because they're in the healthcare system that we're finding these things out? Or is it because long COVID is causing it? And it's really hard to separate those two things. Well, I don't think that there's anyone who isn't ready to move past COVID, long COVID. Um, but it is what it is, and it's still here. Do you think that there's enough awareness of long COVID across the general public? Awareness is better, I think, especially in this age of you know politicizing health, healthcare, medicine, misinformation, disinformation. It's really important to provide good information that people can understand. Stories and narratives are more powerful for people than numbers sometimes. You know, if we had a close family member that was impacted by long COVID and we watched it with our own eyes, that's much more believable to us than these, you know, quoting these like prevalence numbers and millions of people. And like, that doesn't touch home. That doesn't resonate with us. And so I think it's really important when we're communicating information and thinking about how do we get the message across in a way that builds trust and is accurate and actually helps improve public health. So health for the population, but also for the individuals involved. Well, what's been the most promising developments in the fight against this disease? I think we have a much better understanding of the what and the who than we did early on. We still need to do much better in the way of treatment. People have very limited treatment options. I mentioned the Recover Initiative, and I would be remiss in saying um, the Recover Initiative has been a little bit of a, I would say, a disappointment and still waiting to see headline results coming from a more than $1 billion investment by U.S. taxpayers. And there's been media attention around that lately. And I hope that that attention is actually um, some fuel to continue doing the studies that need to be done. And there are new studies coming down the pipeline. I am more of an optimist than a pessimist. And so I'm hopeful that we will um, will make improvements. But this is the nature of, kind of learning as we're going and same thing with like vaccine development during the pandemic and kind of building the tracks as the train is barreling ahead. Vaccination is protective in developing initial COVID infection and appears to also be, even if you get um, COVID, makes it less likely to develop long COVID. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Bodwin. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for watching. I'm Dana Taylor. I'll see you next time.